This is a lecture for the advanced class for the esophagus, liver, and pancreas. The endoscopic findings here is that with A, you see the linear furrows, B, the circular rings, C, the nodules, and D, the shearings. Eosinophilic esophagitis is characterized by swelling of the esophagus caused by an infiltration of eosinophils. There could also be a personal or family history of other allergic diseases, and the most common food triggers are milk, egg, wheat, rye, and beef. Clinical symptoms would be severe heartburn, difficulty swallowing, food impaction in the esophagus, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. The clinical and diagnostics are based on symptoms. An endoscopic biopsy finding of eosinophils that infiltrated the esophageal tissue would be present. Also, allergy skin testing can help determine a person's allergens. Treatment would be acid suppression and corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are frequently used to treat esophageal esophagitis when avoidance of allergic triggers does not relieve the symptoms. Corticosteroids may be used orally, like prednisone, or a topical therapy, such as inhaled corticosteroids, like fluticasone. In asthma, for which fluticasone is typically used, it is inhaled. In esophageal esophagitis, it is swallowed, and this results in the delivery of the drug directly to the esophagus. Esophageal diverticula occur in three main areas. Zenker's diverticulum is the most common location and is above the upper esophageal sphincter. Traction diverticulum is near the esophageal midpoint. An epiphrenic diverticulum is above the lower esophageal sphincter. Esophageal diverticula are sac-like outpouchings of one or more layers of the esophagus. The pharyngeal pouches, the Zenker's diverticula, occur most commonly in older adult patients older than 60 years of age. The clinical symptoms of esophageal diverticula is that the patient frequently complains of tasting sour food and smelling a foul odor caused by the stagnant food. Attraction diverticulum may not have signs and symptoms. Symptoms for esophageal diverticula would be dysphagia, regurgitation, chronic cough, aspiration, and weight loss. Diagnostic would be endoscopy, barium studies, and complications would include malnutrition, aspiration, and perforation. Treatment may be necessary if nutrition is disrupted and a diet is limited to foods that are blenderized. Surgery would be an endoscopic or open approach. The open approach has significant morbidity. An endoscopic stapling diverticulotomy or diverticulostomy has decreased complications. Open approaches have been associated with significant morbidity because most patients are older and many have other medical problems. The most serious complication is perforation of the esophagus. The esophageal strictures usually develop over a long time and result in dysphagia, regurgitation, and weight loss. And causes include GERD, which is the most common cause, ingestion of strong acids or alkalis, trauma, including throat lacerations and gunshot wounds, and also due to scar formation. Treatment is dilated endoscopically and surgical incision, and a patient may have a temporary or a permanent gastrostomy. Esophageal achalasia is a rare chronic disorder that affects one per 100,000 Americans and affects all ages and both genders. This occurs in the lower two-thirds of the esophagus, and symptoms would include peristalsis, which could be absent, impairment of the neurons that innervate the esophagus, and unopposed contraction of the lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter pressure would increase, causing an incomplete relaxation, and the obstruction would occur at or near the diaphragm. The symptoms of achalasia would be dysphagia, which is the most common symptom, and difficulty with liquids and solids could have a substernal chest pain during or after a meal, and halitosis. Halitosis is foul-smelling breath and the inability to belch. Patients may also report a globus sensation or substernal chest pain, which is similar to angina pain, that occurs during or immediately after a meal. Patients with achalasia also report symptoms of GERD and regurgitation of the sour-tasting food and liquids, especially when they are lying down. 
about two-thirds of patients experience nocturnal regurgitation. Pneumatic dilation is an attempt to treat achalasia by maintaining an adequate lumen and decreasing lower esophageal sphincter tone. Surgical therapy would be Heller myotomy, which is done laparoscopically, where the lower esophageal sphincter is surgically disrupted. Because GERD in esophagitis and stricture is a common complication, the patient often has anti-reflux surgery performed at the same time. The drug therapy is smooth muscle relaxants and botulinum toxin injections, which can provide one to two years of relief. Examples of smooth muscle relaxants include nitrates, isosorbide denitrate, and calcium channel blockers like nifedipine. The injection of botulinum toxin endoscopically into the lower esophageal sphincter gives short-term relief of symptoms and improves the esophageal emptying. It works by promoting relaxation of the smooth muscle. The treatment is used for older patients for whom surgery and pneumatic dilation may not be appropriate because of other chronic illnesses. This is collaborative care. The goal is symptom relief. Patient would eat slowly, a semi-soft bland diet, drink with meals, and sleep with the head of the bed elevated. Food and fluid accumulate in the lower esophagus, resulting in a dilation of the lower esophagus. The result of this condition is dilation of the lower esophagus proximal to the tapering effect segment of the lower esophagus. There is a selective loss of inhibitory neurons resulting in unopposed contraction of the lower esophageal sphincter. The diagnostics are radiological studies, a barium swallow, monometric studies of lower esophagus, and an endoscopy. The collaborative care goal is to relieve symptoms, improve esophageal emptying, and prevent development of mega esophagus. The endoscopic pneumatic dilation could be done, which is an outpatient procedure, and the lower esophageal sphincter is disrupted with use of balloons of progressively larger diameters. Repeat dilations are often required. Esophageal varices are dilated, torturous veins in the lower portion of the esophagus. This can result in portal hypertension and a common complication of liver cirrhosis. Due to the elevated pressure in the veins that drain into the portal system, it is often a source of massive hemorrhage. The potential for bleeding is increased by blood clotting abnormalities seen in patients with liver disease. The dilated veins are usually found in the submucosa of the lower esophagus and occur in about one-third of patients with cirrhosis. Mortality is about 45 to 50 percent. Hemorrhage occurs from muscular exertion, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, reflux of stomach content, especially alcohol. Medical management of esophageal varices is preferably a non-surgical approach. This is because of the high rate of mortality with emergency surgery. Pharmacological therapy would include vasopressin, as this constricts the arterial bed and decreases at the portal pressure. Nitroglycerin could be used to decrease the side effects of angina. Also, a balloon tamponade which is pressure exerted against the bleeding varices. Other medical management would include endoscopic scleropathy, which uses a sclerosing agent injected through the endoscope into the varices to promote thrombosis. Esophageal banding therapy, this is the use of band ligation. Surgical management would be surgical bypass procedures. Nursing management is to monitor vital signs, possibly need TPN, prevention of vomiting and straining, an NG tube for gastric suction, a quiet environment, and help reduce anxiety. Bleeding varices usually occur secondary to cirrhosis of the liver. Branches of the vena cava and the eye zygos vein combine with smaller vessels of the lower esophagus. The vessels are inelastic, engorged, and torturous due to high pressure secondary to portal hypertension. Anything that increases pressure, like coughing, sneezing, or causes irritation like vomiting, may cause massive bleeding. Serious liver disease, such as cirrhosis, can cause a number of complications, including esophageal varices. Esophageal varices develop when the normal blood flow to the liver is blocked. The blood then backs up into the smaller, more fragile blood vessels in the esophagus, and sometimes in the stomach or rectum, causing the vessels to swell. Esophageal varices do not produce symptoms unless they rupture and bleed and a life-threatening condition now requires immediate medical care. When not controlled, esophageal bleeding would be fatal. 
Esophageal varices are dilated blood vessels within the wall of the esophagus. Patients with cirrhosis develop portal hypertension. And when portal hypertension occurs, the blood flow through the liver is diminished. The blood flow increases through microscopic blood vessels within the esophageal wall. As this blood flow increases, the blood vessels begin to dilate, and the dilation can be just profound. The original diameter of the blood vessel is measured in millimeters, while the final, fully established esophageal varix may be 0.5 to 1 centimeter or larger in diameter. Bleeding varices are a life-threatening complication of portal hypertension because of the increased blood pressure in the portal vein caused by liver disease. Increased pressure causes the veins to balloon outward. The vessel may rupture, causing vomiting of blood and bloody stool or tarry black stool. If a large volume of blood is lost, then signs of shock will develop. Any cause of chronic liver disease can cause bleeding varices. A way to treat this would be the TIPS procedure, the transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt, and that's used to lower pressure in the portal venous system and decrease the risk of bleeding from esophageal varices. Indirect bilirubin and serum albumin levels are not affected by the shunting procedures. A Mallory Weiss tear is a tear in the mucosa near the esophagogastric junction. It is related to severe vomiting. A Mallory Weiss tear is usually caused by forceful or long-term vomiting or coughing. They may also be caused by epileptic convulsions. The tear may be followed by vomiting bright red blood or by passing blood in the stool. Any condition that leads to violent and lengthy bouts of coughing or vomiting can cause these tears. Sangston Blakemore tube is used for a tamponade of bleeding esophageal varices. It has three separate tubes. One leads to the balloon inflated in the stomach to keep the instrument in place and compress the vessel around the cardia. The second leads to a long narrow balloon that exerts pressure against the wall of the esophagus. And the third is attached to a suction apparatus for aspirating the contents of the stomach. Next is pancreatitis. This is an acute inflammation process of the pancreas with associated escape of the pancreatic enzyme into surrounding tissue. Pancreatitis is an inflammatory process resulting in autodigestion of the organ by its own enzymes. This can range from mild to severe, whereas a severe form of pancreatitis is characterized by a diffusely bleeding pancreatic tissue, fibrosis, and death. Mortality is due to hypotension, fluid and electrolyte imbalance, and shock. The primary etiological factor are alcoholism, biliary tract disease, and may be a complication of viral or bacterial disease, peptic ulcer, and trauma. The pancreas has two functions in the endocrine and exocrine system. The endocrine function is the production of insulin. The exocrine is the digestive enzyme. There are two types of pancreatitis, acute and chronic. The number one cause of acute and chronic pancreatitis is alcohol. Alcohol destroys the GI tract. If a person is an alcoholic, their GI tract is getting destroyed. And this happens when a person gets scar tissue in the pancreas. And the scar tissue can cause an occlusion and the enzymes cannot get out of the small intestine and they back up into the pancreas. When this happens, necrosis of blood vessels can occur leading to a generalized hemorrhaging, which then can lead to shock and death. The complication of pancreatitis is the patient could develop jaundice, and that occurs from swelling of the head of the pancreas, which blocks the blood flow through the common bile duct. Transient hyperglycemia can occur from release of glucagon and decreased release of insulin from damaged isolate cells. The diagnostic testing would be a CT scan with contrast. Lab findings would be an increase in amylase, lipase, elastase, trypsin, glucose, bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, lactate dehydrogenase, liver enzymes like AST, ALT, and bilirubin. Other labs would be an increase in potassium, white blood cells, cholesterol, and increase in urine amylase. The decrease in labs would be albumin, calcium, sodium, and magnesium and sometimes it might include the potassium. The potassium would be low due to dehydration, vomiting, and the binding of calcium in areas of fat necrosis. 
For pancreatitis, the assessment should include a respiratory rate and oxygen saturation, auscultating breast sounds, and the patient should be upright in a semi-phallic position to enhance diaphragmatic excursion. Coughing and deep breathing can help improve respiratory function. For the fluid balance, monitor the eyes and nose and weights and measure the abdominal girth if pancreatic ascites is suspected. Frequent pain assessment and administering opioid analgesics, maintain MPO status to decrease pancreatic enzyme secretion. The abdominal pain might be in the mid epigastric area radiating to the back or the flank. Also, it can radiate to the left upper quadrant. The patient may end up assuming a fetal position or lean forward while sitting. This helps to relieve the pressure of the inflamed pancreas on the celiac plexus nerves. The pain is intense and continuous. Pain is located in the mid epigastric area, frequently acute in onset 24 to 48 hours after a heavy meal or alcoholic digestion. It may be more severe after meals and unrelieved by an acids, and it may be accompanied by abdominal distension. Nursing interventions include pain medications like morphine or Dilaudid. Antispasmodic drugs help to decrease GI motility. NPO is to rest the pancreas. C for calcium to monitor the levels and look for clinical signs as to whether or not replacement is needed. Monitor for hypocalcemia like tetany, Trousseau sign, Shafostic. Replace the fluid and electrolyte. The NG losses plus the fluid shifts into the peritoneum and TPO if the patient is to be NPO over seven to 10 days. Endocrine, control of hyperglycemia, insulin, glucagon, calcitonin, and somatostatin sometimes are used. A is for antibiotics for infection with fever. S for steroids to help decrease the inflammation. Other medications that may be given would be pancreatic enzymes, such as pancreolipase taken with meals for fat and protein digestion. Education is to take it before and after meals, swallow without chewing to minimize the oral irritation, and mix the powder forms in applesauce or fruit or protein-containing foods. Wipe the lips to avoid skin irritation. Another med would be anticholinergics, glucagon, histamine inhibitors, as these all decrease vagal stimulation, decrease GI motility, and inhibit pancreatic secretions. Complications of pancreatitis would be ARDS, as pulmonary failure accounts for half of all deaths within seven days of the disease. DIC, disseminated intervascular coagulation, hypercoagulation of the blood and development of microthrombi. Shock, peripheral vasodilation from vasoactive substances. Acute renal failure in response to hypovolemia or a paralytic ileus from release of the pancreatic enzymes into the abdominal cavity. The nutritional status. The patient needs to decrease gastric secretions. This is done by keeping the patient MPO using gastric suction and bed rest. Bed rest decreases stomach secretions. With pancreatitis, remember you want to keep their stomachs empty and dry. And that's why they have the NG tube and suction. If anything gets into the stomach, the pancreas thinks it needs to make the enzymes. Assess for discomfort with the meals. Monitor the frequency and color of the stool. Monitor their blood sugar levels. Identify foods that aggravate the symptoms. Now vomiting can vary in severity and it is worsened by ingestion of food or fluid. Vomiting does not relieve the pain and is usually accompanied by nausea. The abdominal assessment would reveal epigastric tenderness to deep palpation. Rigidity, tenderness, guarding, distended, decreased or absent peristalsis, and paralytic ileus. Malabsorption and steatorrhea may occur late in the disease, diminished or absent bowel sounds, or ecchymosis in the flank or around the umbilicus, which may indicate a severe hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Hypovolemic shock. The pain may be sudden and intense or begin as a mild pain that gets worse when food is eating. Someone with acute pancreatitis often looks and feels very sick. Other symptoms may include swollen and tender abdomen, nausea, vomiting, fever, and rapid pulse. Severe cases may cause dehydration and low blood pressure. The heart, lungs, and kidneys may begin to fail. If bleeding occurs in the pancreas, shock and sometimes even death will follow. 
Bleeding could be from a hemorrhagic necrosis of the pancreas. Gray turners and Cullen sign can be easily confused with one another because they are both characterized by the same physical findings in different locations. Gray turner sign is located on the flanks, where Cullen sign is located around the umbilicus. These can be seen when bleeding occurs inside the abdomen or in the retroperitoneal location. This is most commonly thought to be due to necrotizing pancreatitis, but it can also happen in other conditions such as abdominal aortic aneurysm. A palpable abdominal mass may indicate the presence of a pancreatic abscess, which will require rapid surgical drainage to prevent sepsis. Absent bowel sounds, abdominal tenderness, and left upper quadrant pain are common in acute pancreatitis. The patient with acute pancreatitis will receive intravenous fluids to replace the lost fluids and maintain the blood pressure and allow the pancreas to heal. Chronic pancreatitis may take pancreatic enzymes and insulin because the damaged pancreas no longer produces enough of these. Pancreatic enzyme supplements are given in advanced chronic pancreatitis as the pancreas may stop producing the enzymes needed to digest fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Enzyme supplements at meals can help the body digest fats, retain nutrients, and gain weight. Side effects of pancreatic enzymes that are given to treat chronic pancreatitis include abdominal discomfort and soreness of the mouth and anus. People who are allergic to pork or do not eat pork for other reasons should not take these enzymes because they are made of pork protein. Insulin may be given because an advanced chronic pancreatitis may lead to diabetes if the part of the pancreas that produces insulin becomes damaged. Anticholinergic drugs are given to dry the person out. When they do start taking things by mouth, then it will start with clear liquids to see how they do. An endoscopic retrograde coleangiopancreatography, also known as ERCP, is a test that combines the use of a flexible lighted scope with x-ray pictures to examine the tubes that drain the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. The endoscope is inserted through the mouth and generally moved down the throat into the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum until it reaches the point where the ducts from the pancreas, the pancreatic ducts, and gallbladder, the bile ducts, drain into the duodenum. ERCP can treat certain problems found during the test. If an abnormal growth is seen, a sample of the tissue can be taken for further biopsy. An islet transplantation is a transplant of isolated islets from a donor pancreas into another person. It is a treatment for type 1 diabetes mellitus. Once transplanted, the islets begin to produce insulin, actively regulating the levels of glucose in the blood. Islets are usually infused into the patient's liver. If the cells are not from a genetically identical donor, the patient's body will recognize them as foreign and the immune system will begin to attack them as with any transplant rejection. To prevent this, immunosuppressant drugs can be given. Malignant disease of the exocrine pancreas and more than 85% of the cases are ductal endocarcinomas. Two thirds develop in the head and the remainder occur in the body or the tail of the gland. It occurs more commonly in males. The tumor is usually deeply encased in normal tissue and poorly demarcated. The common duct is often obstructed and distended by the presence of the tumor. Metastases has almost always occurred before the tumor produces the first symptoms. Effective pain management is necessary in order for the patient to improve nutrition, be receptive to education, or manage anxiety or depression. Non-surgical treatment is high doses of opioid analgesics. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, Intensive external beam radiation therapy can be given by shrinking the tumor cells. Surgical management would include a Whipple procedure. If the patient has a pancreatic transplant, most transplants are anastomosed to the bladder and drain pancreatic enzymes into the urine. When the pancreas is rejected or functioning inadequately, the level of the pancreatic enzymes in the urine decreases by 25% or more. Symptoms of pancreatic cancer would include clay-colored stool, dark urine, abdominal pain, which is usually vague, weight loss, anorexia, nausea and vomiting, glucose intolerance, GI bleeding, splenomegaly, and ascites. Jaundice could also occur where there is lesions of the pancreatic head.
The Whipple procedure, or pancreaticoduodenectomy, is the most commonly performed surgery to remove tumors in the pancreas. In a standard Whipple procedure, the surgery removes the head of the pancreas, the gallbladder, part of the duodenum, the pylorus, and the lymph nodes near the head of the pancreas. The surgeon then reconnects the remaining pancreas and digestive organs so that the pancreatic digestive enzymes, bile, and stomach contents will flow into the small intestine during digestion. In another type of Whipple procedure known as pylorus preserving Whipple, the bottom portion of the stomach or the pylorus is not removed. In both cases, the surgery usually lasts between five to eight hours. After a Whipple procedure, the most common complication is delayed gastric emptying, a condition in which the stomach takes too long to empty its contents. Usually, after seven to 10 days, the stomach begins to work properly. If delayed, gastric emptying persists and supplemental feeding by a feeding tube may be started. The condition usually lasts for another seven to 10 days, but could last as long as a few weeks. The most serious potential complication is abdominal infection due to leakage where the pancreas has been connected to the intestine. This occurs in approximately 10% of patients and is usually managed by a combination of draining tubes, antibiotics, and supplemental tube feedings. Patients who have undergone the Whipple procedure may experience long-term effects, including digestive difficulties.